Morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> All right, cool. <clears throat> I got to say, um, it's, it's pretty inspiring to uh, finally see an O'Reilly style conference about data. You know, I think it's been actually a long time in the works, and I think. All of us in this room have been sort of toiling away trying to make data real, and I think this is actually going to go down as really one of the more symbolic events in the sort of the evolution of the industry. And that's kind of what I really wanted to actually spend just a few minutes talking about, is almost to kind of take a little step back. I think there's so many amazing sessions today about the actual work that we're doing and the science of making data useful. Um, but I actually kind of wanted to reflect a little bit on where we are today, and I think as, as, a, as an organization or a team of people together to kind of inspire us or rally us to kind of move forward, because I think we're still very far from where the ultimate promise of all these things are. And to kind of frame the equation a little bit or frame the discussion or the chat, uh, I just wanted to share one quote from, from Steve Jobs that I always loved. And it's not Steve Jobs today, you know, you know sort of wonder genius of the $300 billion company. It's uh, Steve Jobs in 1995. Um, when he actually was kicked out of Apple, and uh, he was starting next and trying to figure out how to sort of create that next revolution. And I thought what he said was really insightful. First, he said that you know, these sort of step function changes, they're really rare. You know, they don't happen all the time. Um, and maybe something that's intuitively obvious, but I think is very real, is it takes actually a, a very sort of unique intersection of a lot of things to make happen to really sort of force this change. Right? And I think you know, what I'm sort of here to talk about today, which may be obvious in the room, but I think for us it's you know, sort of really important, is I think that data <clears throat> is one of those really step function changes on the, in the industry. I think it's on the level of the PC revolution, the sort of ride with the internet that we've had over the last 10 to 20 years. You know, data can have that kind of impact, not just as professionals in the industry, but that kind of impact on the world. Right? And so when we think about that, and we think the implications of it, I think some of it is actually not totally wildly well known yet, certainly to the people outside of these, these four walls and the broader sort of set of people that are, that are just you now sort of working. And so what I thought I would do is, in a story about data, is to just share a little bit of data first about myself. And hopefully you guys will find this amusing, if not maybe a little bit embarrassing for myself. I'm going to share a few facts, so here we go. Uh, so as those of you guys don't know, some of you might have known, for the last 10 years, I've been involved in uh, helping to start and run a company called Greenplum. We built database software. We had a fantastic run. We sort of got acquired by EMC at the summer of last year, and we're sort of carrying on that mission. Maybe what a little few of you may know um, beyond that, actually, is for three years prior, my only other job was with an internet company called Sandpiper Networks, and we built caching systems. Um, and I was really happy. That was actually my first job out of school, and I was really happy to get that job because the only other work experience I had had before that was with a company called California Profitale. And uh, it was a company that I started out of my dorm room to try and bring fruit-flavored beers to the world. And I can actually assure you that was actually not a step function change for the industry. Uh, it was something that died a very quick death. Uh, and so before that, before uh, California Profitale, actually I attended UCLA from 1991 to 1995, where I actually had a very undistinguished academic career. And so I was actually able to bring up some data. I could actually pull up my records. And what I thought I would do is I'd share with you my freshman transcripts from my first year of college as a computer science student. I'm actually not going to share with you the grades, but I can tell you that I probably drank a little too much beer, and it was a fast track to dropping out. You guys are supposed to be laughing with me. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is supposed to be funny. Um, but uh, you know, actually, UCLA actually was, it was a big jump for me, actually, from UCLA. I moved uh, to Los Angeles from Edina, Minnesota, uh, where I spent my formative years through grade school and high school. And uh, for those you don't know, courtesy of Google Maps, Edina, in reference to Minneapolis, actually is about 20, 20 miles outside the suburbs of Minneapolis. And so this is actually a data center crowd, what I don't have to remind people. But in Silicon Valley, you have to do it all the time, because they think the world revolves around between here and San Francisco, that Minnesota actually is uh, one of the 50 states, and it's located in the middle of the country. <laughs> Um, so I'm actually going to stop there. You know, I'm going to keep feeding you a little more data, but I'm not going to keep going all the way, way past. I'm actually going to bring you to the present. As you can find out very quickly on the web that where I live is at 693 Douglas Street in San Francisco, California. So I went and, and did Google Street Maps, and so like everybody, I saw my house. What I was actually really alarmed at is that's actually a picture of my wife on Google Maps unloading the groceries out of our car. And I took that same street address, and I put it in any number of, of uh, <clears throat> um, home sites. And uh, what I was alarmed to see is that anybody can see, and actually I'm not going to show you what I paid, because uh, not very expensive, but I couldn't afford it, um, what I paid for the house, what the guy who sold me the house, what he paid for it, and what the government gets. All this data is actually really available. 
Right? And the last piece of data that I want to share with you before we sort of get into the rest of the speech is something actually I'm not very proud of. But I think for me is one of the best examples of kind of what's going on in the world of data today. Uh, and this is Curdy of photonotice.com. So on March 23rd, 2010, I actually got a traffic citation. <laughs> and I don't know if you can actually see, but that's me of a picture of actually whistling uh, blindly as I <laughs> cross a red light and, uh, and uh, you know, get a traffic. And, and I found out, my wife sent me an email. She said, good job, honey. I said, what? She sent me this link, I log in, and there's a quick time movie of me actually breaking, uh, breaking laws. Um, but, you know, I think that's what we're talking about today. For us, that's what I, I think all of us understand. You know, that's the new realities of today. That's kind of what's become the new normal. And it's a story we're starting to tell a little bit more. It's what we call Your Data Rules the World. But I think a lot of us, you know, my mother and uh, people that are not in our industry, what they don't understand is that my data, your data, it's contributing to this global data set. And that data set itself is changing the world as we know it. As we look at the ecosystem that's being built around data, all of the organizations that are collecting that data, and the set of companies that are built on aggregating that data, cleansing it, transforming it, and redistributing that back out, there's a whole new economy obviously being built around data itself. That's a really, really big deal. But this sort of future that I think we've all seen coming for a few years, I think one of the favorite quotes that I see Tim use all the time, which is, I believe, and it's the futures here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. That's very true. I think it goes back in my mind. I'm so excited to be part of this conference. For me, one of my good friends, Roger Magulis, for me, he was one of the first guys I ever heard coin the term big data. And that was five years ago, kind of seeing what a lot of us were doing with data, the new technologies we were playing with, and really saying, hey, there's really something significant here. So again, these things really take time, right? Media soon followed. There was a really big article in 2008. Wired came out with the petabyte age. I love the Economist uh, front cover story article that came out last year about the data deluge, and mainstream media is covering that now today. Right? So it's really starting to happen. That's really exciting. I think we have to sort of take a step back and say, well, why now? Is now really the time where it's going to get to that next level? And I think there's two reasons why it's happening. A good friend of Green Plum, a guy named Joe Hellerstein, I think he was here yesterday, a professor at Berkeley, I think had a great phrase where he called it the industrial revolution of data. That's one dimension of it, the fact that for the first time in human history, right, machines are generating more information than we as humans are. That's a big deal. So there's this explosion of information. I guess we all kind of know that. At the same time, I think what's happening is that we're having this undeniable convergence of technology, right? Multi-core computing, multi-gigabit Ethernet network, the state of storage technology moving to flash and SSD, virtualization, all these things normally being labeled the cloud. It's a big technology shift. At the end of the day, what those things mean for the first time is I think Computing and the processing of data is literally 100 to 1,000 times faster and cheaper than it ever was before. We're actually kind of uh, sharing with and giving a few of these drives away. This is one terabyte we can hold in our hand. You know, I think for me and for a lot of us that have been in the industry, that's kind of mind-blowing, right? And so what I think happens is when you take all of this information and you combine it with platforms that are that cheap and that powerful, amazing things can happen. And that's what we call actually data heroics. And what I thought I'd do is share just a few examples of things that I think are inspiring and a sense of what the future is going to be about. The first one, I think, is what I call you know, Google Flu Trends. I think many of you might already know this. But this is where you actually take simple standard data that's already been collected and use it to gain insight in new interesting problems. So Google collects standard search query traffic. They look for incident terms that are relevant to flu trends. And then they try to get predictive about where flu epidemics are actually outbreaking in the world ahead of where we understand them to be. So again, you can take a normal data set and apply it to solve really, really interesting problems that have impact on the world. These are the kinds of things that are going to happen. And I think actually data also is not just about saving lives and saving problems. This is also going to change the way that we express ourselves. Uh, it's going to change the face of art and media. One of my favorite examples a few years ago was an art exhibit by Jonathan Harris and Sepp Kamavar called We Feel Fine. Right? And they mined all the sentiment analysis and the dating sites and the blogs to visualize human emotion at a global scale. And really, really amazingly powerful stuff. Uh, data is changing the face of government. Right, One project that I was really excited about, and Tim with Government 2.0 has been a huge thought leader in this space, was with the um, CIO of, of the US and this project called USAspending.gov, where every detailed spending transaction is actually stored and collected. So $1 trillion of our federal spend every year is now. That data has been made available uh, for analysis. We can see by mayor, by district, by government, by state, by department, by function. We all have this access to so this transparency and access to information 
hopefully can lead over time to new forms of government efficiency and transparency. At the same time, I think we have all these amazing things to the future. At the same time, I think we, we know we still have a long way to go. Right? And one story I wanted to share that was in the news recently I thought was amazing was American Express. Hopefully there's no one in American Express here. But uh, uh, there was an article that said, hey, last November, my nine-year-old son, he got a credit card application. And by January, little Billy got four more solicitations. Right? So this kind of targeting still has a little ways to go before we get perfect. And I think that's, if I sort of end the, the talk or sort of the last part of my chat today is to say, hey, we're kind of sitting at this really unique point in time. Uh, we have this opportunity in front of us. But in order for it to have the same impact that I believe we can to incite not only a computing but a business and a cultural revolution around data, there needs to be a big call to action. You know, so the things that we need, DJ talked a little bit about it, but I think it starts with education. You know, we need investment in data scientists like we've been breeding computer scientists for the last 20 years. Right? I love that Hal Varian quote where he said, the, the, next, the sexy job over the next 10 years are going to be statisticians. You know, people laugh at that, but there's a lot of truth to that, how we can encourage people to go to school to learn how to study analyzing, visualizing, and sharing of information. We need government. You know, we need government to get involved, to provide subsidies, to in provide investments in the research areas that are going to provide new breakthroughs in the data. We need industry, I think, to embrace data like they did with the web and not have it be something like the business intelligence or the data warehousing industry that we know it, but embrace data like they've embraced the internet as the singular focus to really change how they do business entirely. We need that kind of scale of adoption. And I think what's probably near and dear to a lot of us in this room is I think we need startups. We need a lot of startups. We need startups that are focused on data, building technologies, and also caring. I think a lot of the passion for the industry and how we actually want it to unfold will be determined by a lot of the people right here in this room. And that's kind of the last closing thought. I think you know, I couldn't be more sort of excited to be a part of this community. Um, and I think if we all continue to rally together and push forward, we can make data a set of inspirational um, <clears throat> movement in the way that I think the web has been for us for the last 10 to 20 years. And I think the world needs that right now. And I think Tim uh, said it best. And I think like he is, he's prescient, a little ahead of his time before this conference was even sort of a twinkle in anybody's eye. He said sort of data is the next intel inside. Uh, and I really believe that. Thank you very much. <laughs>